house of the Lord on this Lord's Day. Isn't it great to be together with the family of God? Uh, it's great to see every, each and every one of you. I also want to remind uh, everybody that uh, we are not only gathered as a physical community, but we are also gathered as a worshiping community with people around our country who are worshiping with us online on Facebook Live. And so we've got new cameras in this building. Everybody wave at the cameras once more and say, hey, church family, welcome, welcome, welcome. Good to see you. Praise the Lord. Uh, and for those of you who are online, I'd remind you, that you can follow along the order of worship and get all the words to the songs uh, on the church's Facebook page. Also, there's a discussion guide that all of our Sunday school classes are using, and that would be helpful uh, to any of you who are worshiping, either in person or online. That's also on our Facebook page. And uh, we have online giving, so if you'd like to uh, give a gift to the church, you can do that through uh, the church's website. Now... I want y'all to look up in the booth and wave at Chuck and Nikki Davis and say, thank you, thank you, thank you. We have had a number of technological problems this week, and Chuck and Nikki Davis planned for five weeks, five months to be away this Sunday on an anniversary trip, and they came back uh, from their anniversary trip to help us to get it all going. So when you see no words on the screen, all I want you to tell Chuck and Nikki is thank you, all right? You don't need to point anything out to them. They know, they know, and they are working really hard on it to fix everything. Just thank them, all right? Can you all do that for me? Just say thank you. We appreciate you so much. Yeah. When you, when you work in the booth, you get a lot of advice. It's not necessarily helpful, all right? So we just want to express gratitude and thank you for coming back, and we're going to get it fixed. So, but in the meantime, if you want to sing along, you're going to have to use your electronic device. All the words are on your electronic device until, until we get that little problem fixed, all right? Thank you, Chuck and Nikki. We love you. And uh, we're going to sing about the one place where our hope cannot be shaken, and that's on the rock of Christ Jesus. Let's sing all the verses of My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood. the spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose faith let us now declare. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Well, once again, welcome to the First United Methodist Church of Mariana. It is such a beautiful and wonderful day to worship our Lord, our God. Um, we have a few announcements this morning just to keep everybody up to date. Uh, we have three ways to worship. We have in-person worship, we have worship on Facebook Live, and we also offer a drive-in worship um, after church, uh, our service here at 11 o'clock in the parking lot behind the church office. Uh, for those of you who are here in person so that we can uh, maintain the safety of this gathering, you should have received a squirt of hand sanitizer and a temperature check at the door. And of course, um, we are required to wear face masks so that we can continue to worship in person. As we continue our fall stewardship campaign, um, please remember that next week, October 25th, is Commitment Sunday. Um, pledge cards are available to turn in early. There's some at the front door if you need another one. Um, and some great news, we are already one quarter of the way to our goal, and it's not even Commitment Sunday yet. So that is, that is a tribute to what an amazing and faithful family, church family, that we have here. So thank you so much for that. Um, we have quite a few Sunday school classes that are resuming. We have our open door Sunday school class that meets in the youth building. We um, have our Bill Shack Sunday school class that has resumed, and that is in the educational building upstairs. And this morning, the Gap Sunday school class will resume, and that is in the upstairs room of the Wesley Center. So there are many other ways uh, for you to worship after this, to gather together, um, and that is good news. Our children's programs are up and running. Um, running this fall, we've got a pumpkin patch trip that is going to happen immediately after the service today. We can see all these beautiful and handsome little boys and girls in here today. They're going to go to the pumpkin patch immediately after. If you have any questions, please see Blake or Marissa Mays on that. And to continue with the fall festivities, the youth will be carving pumpkins Saturday, October 24th at 5.30 at the Mays House. So if you have any questions about that, please see our wonderful youth pastor, Blake Mays. Um, and lastly, for our, our, our youth and children's program, Friday mornings, Blake has started a breakfast devotional. It's at 7 a.m. and held at Dunkin' Donuts. So for all the youth that want to get up early, get some sugar, get them going, get a devotional. Um, we also have the van available so that the children can be, children, youth, or the, excuse me, the youth can be driven directly to high school from there so the parents don't have to, to stay and do that. So let's continue to worship. Miss Janie, we're going to talk to these little people today. Come on down. It's children's minute time. Come on, everybody. Come on, all the children. There's more. You brought some food. Oh, good. All right, here I come. You want a microphone, too? You might need one. You might I need might one. Need what are we eating? I'm not telling yet. Good morning. Come on down. I am so glad to see all of y'all, especially my little girl that's in my room this year. See, I've got students that I got now and ex-students, and oh, I just love it. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit this morning about how we should use our money for God, okay? But first... I got a story to tell you. Last week, I went out to my mailbox, and I got this letter out of my mailbox, and it was from Jackson Hospital. So I opened it up. I just knew it was a bill. And I opened it, <laughs> I opened it up, and oh my gosh, it was a refund. I had gotten a refund where I had overpaid them a long time ago, and I opened it up. It was a check for a hundred dollars. Whoa, that was a lot of money to me. You know what I did? I ran down to the bank and catched it real quick so they couldn't get it back. <laughs> and so I had a hundred dollars. I thought, wow, that's a lot of money. Well, and so here is the hundred dollar bill or one like it, okay? So I had the hundred dollar bill with me and so... 
So I went out to Beef O'Brady's to get some supper, and I was on my way to the restroom, and my eye caught that little machine over there, you know, in, that y'all like to play over there, that claw machine. I love that claw machine. And I looked in it, and there was a Fitbit. Oh, I have been wanting a Fitbit so bad because now that I'm out there at that new school, I bet I walk a thousand miles a day. So I wanted to see really if I was walking that many miles a day. So I took that hundred dollar bill and I went and got some change for it. And I was going to get that Fitbit out of that claw machine. Now I knew I could do it. You know why? Because I have a claw machine at home. Uh huh. So I had been practicing, and I knew how to use that claw machine. You put the money in. Well, let me put the money in. You put the money in. Oh, and then you move that claw around. You got to get it over there. Now mine had candy in it, so that's why I'm so good at it. And then you drop it down, and you get it. Come on, go get it. Oh, I missed it again. <laughs> oh, I missed it again. Oh, but I promise you I'm good at it. Hey, if not, guess what? I can stick my hand down in there and get it. But you know what? I'm going to turn that off. Well, I said I was. There. So I knew I was good at it. So I got my change for my $100 bill. And I went over to the claw machine, put my money in there, got that claw, grabbed that Fitbit, picked it up, brought it over to the hole to drop it in, and doggone it, I dropped it. So I didn't get it. So I just put some more money in that machine again, got that claw going, pick it up. Move it over. Oh, I dropped it again. I did it over and over and over again. I bet I stayed there an hour trying to get that Fitbit out. And then all of a sudden, I had no money left. None whatsoever. I had spent all that time and all that money for nothing. Now... God wants us to use our money in a wise way. That was not a wise way, was it? He wants us to be responsible for our money because it's his money. He's given it to us to be responsible. And one way that we can be responsible is to give our money to the church because they do wonderful things with our money in the church. So he wants us to give our money to the church. That's called tithing. And in the Bible, it tells us to give 10% of our money to God. And so that's what we should do. Now, second, he wants us to be responsible for our money. What I did out at Beef O'Brady's was not responsible. No, it was not responsible. And God does not want us to waste our money. So I want to challenge you this week to use the money that God has given you in a responsible way so that you can make this a better world and that you can show people that you love God. Let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Dear God, we just thank you for all the things that you give us. We pray that we will use them for your honor and your glory. And all God's children said, Amen. While the children return to their seats, I want to invite Lynn Large to come up and share testimony of how uh, his uh, faithfulness to God and giving has been a blessing to his life. Uh, we've had testimony since Easter, and particularly during the stewardship time, we want uh, these testimonies to be about this very important part of our discipleship. Lynn is... Uh, our, our lay delegate to annual conference uh, serves in so many ways in music in this church and is a dear friend to all of us. Thank you, Lynn, for agreeing to share your heart today. Good morning. It's a privilege to speak to you this morning about stewardship during the campaign. 
As I prepared, I thought about my time here in this church and how I've been blessed to have been here. And as I thought about that, I realized 55 years ago this month, I visited this church for the first time. I was a teacher in the area, a music teacher and a coach. That's kind of weird, but, but I was. And that was the very first time that for me coming here. And during that week, I got a knock at my door from Cliff Abbott. Many of you maybe remember him as the minister here. And I didn't know it at the time, but they were looking for a music director here. And so that's one thing that I, that I had always wanted to do, I thought, in my life was to be a, a school music teacher and a, a church music director. I think God maybe planted me here because that next Sunday I was on the platform over there as the new music director. So uh, it was good timing. <laughs> and there was a lot more to that blessing too. I found out that there was a very talented young lady named Annika who was the organist. And a couple of years or three later, we got married right here in this church. And then uh, there were, that's not all to the story. A few years later, we had three sons that uh, we uh, grew, that grew up here and attended this church. And we were so blessed with the church because there were so many things that they could attend here as, as youth, children and youth growing up. And you know, there was the MYF, there was youth choir, there was youth activities week, which was always a big event. And some of the... Uh, Christian friends that they made here are still friends of theirs today. And I, I think back at how much I have grown in my Christian faith, having been here in this church and how blessed I have been. In 1 Timothy, we've read, we read that everything we, we receive is a gift from God. And giving back to him is one of the most rewarding things we can do. One of the joys of giving to our church is knowing that our gifts are joined with many of you, or all of you, who give gifts to this church. And in, in doing so, it funds the uh, facilities upkeep, the leadership, the programs, so many things here locally. And then, uh, being Methodist, we reach around the world, across the nation and around the world. And we, we fund hospitals, missions, uh, give food for people, and one of the big things that I think is important is UMCOR and how it helps in disaster relief. And those are all the, the finest things to give to. Over the years of reading the Bible and studying a little bit, <clears throat> I've been intrigued with a passage from Isaiah, I think it's chapter 40. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. And I've thought of the word wait, and I, I put it in two different meanings, I guess, as I think about it. And one is to wait as one who maybe is in a, a restaurant and waits on tables. And they bring the very best that they can to those people that they're waiting on. And so... This is one of the reasons that I think that we're bringing things to God. And then I also think of wait as waiting on God with patience to give us the strength to carry out his will as we study for it. As we are blessed, it's rewarding then to in turn pass our blessings on to others. And as we give, we also receive. I thought of a story when I was doing this that I heard a long time ago, maybe you've heard it, I don't know. But it seems that this minister was invited to go to another church across town and, and preach one Sunday morning. So he went and he thought he would, for company, he'd take his young son with him. And as they entered the church into the foyer, they saw in there a table with a box on it. And the box had a slot in the top and a sign pointing to it that said, put donations here. And so he thought he would, you know, be a, maybe a teaching moment for his son. So he reached in his pocket, pulled out a dollar, and put it in the slot. 
went on in and preached that morning, and at the end of the service, the fellow who was the moderator, whatever you'd call it, for uh, holding the service together for the home church, he said to the congregation, as you go out, there is a box in the foyer, and uh, that will be a free will offering for our visiting minister. <laughs> so he told, he told them, the, the visiting minister, he said, just get it on your way out there. So uh, he and his son waited around a few minutes, I guess, to make sure everybody had a chance to go. <laughs> <laughs> they went out there, and, and they, uh, they got into the box. And you guessed it, there's one dollar in there. And you know, sometimes out of the mouth of children, they can put us in our place sometimes. He looked up at his dad and said, well, Dad, if you'd put more in it, you'd have got more out of it. Wouldn't you? <laughs> and that's, that's the way it is, I think, with our Christian lives and everything that we do. And we need, to, we, need to put, we need to put ourselves into it. When Nathan called me and asked me to do this, I guess I had no, no longer pushed the button to... To, to cut the, the call off when I thought of the words to an anthem that we've sung here in the choir several times since I've been here. And it's always been one of my favorite. And the words are from Matthew. Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, but lay up and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven that where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Thank you.
those wonderful ladies, thank you very much. As we prepare to go to the Lord in prayer, our Christian love and sympathy go to the family of Kreshel Harrison on his passing this week. His service will be held today in the sanctuary at 3 p.m. with the visitation at 2 p.m. here in the Wesley Center. Our Christian love and sympathy also go to the family of Catherine Mayo. Her service uh, was held on Friday and she also passed away this week. Let us also rem remember other loved ones who could use a special touch from God today. Merle Houston, Karen Vickery, Polly Roberts, and Mike Evans. With these concerns and others, let us go to the Lord in prayer. We ask that you speak to your people today and make our spirits ready to hear from you. Encourage us to obey immediately. Bolster our faith to follow where you are calling us to go. Remind us that your direction for our lives, your solution for our problems, are greater than our simple, short-sighted plans. Help us where our faith is weak, dear Lord. Today, God, teach us to value the virtue of simplicity to be of humble heart, to love sincerely, to be pure in mind and body, to be trusting, and to have one aim in life, to serve you and please you in everything we do. Bless us with total honesty in all of our ways, an unpretentious life, and straightforwardness in dealing with people. May we follow your will always and everywhere and learn to love you above all things. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. I want to say a word of introduction for our hymn today, of our hymn of preparation. It's a song called Simple Gifts. You may not be familiar with this song, even though it's a very classic American song. And this song comes from a community called the Shaker Community. Uh, it was written almost 200 years ago. How many of you have ever heard of Shaker Furniture? Some of you all know what shaker furniture is. During a time that furniture was very complex and highly or ornamented, uh, there was a community that uh, decided to live a simple way of life. And one of the ways they did that is they built very simple furniture. It wasn't supposed to look nice. It was just designed to be simple so they could focus on their prayer and their faith. And uh, other people said, you know what, that's very elegant, elegant took away the complexity, and Shaker Furniture has been very popular uh, outside of the Shaker community ever since. The Shaker community was called Shakers because when they prayed, they would pray so hard that they would begin to shake. Uh, you may recognize this tune to this song uh, about simplicity, simplicity of life. Uh, the tune is, uh, to, is similar to one that we sing from our hymnal called Lord of the Dance. But uh, as somebody pointed out to me a little while ago, uh, Simple Gifts is not sung to the tune of Lord of the Dance. Lord of the Dance is sung to the tune of Simple Gifts. So please stand and let's do the best we can, all right?
may be seated. And I, I thank you uh, for uh, giving it a good try. I wanted a song about the spiritual discipline of, am I on here? Can y'all hear me? No. Where'd Tony go? I think that the microphone is off. Maybe the other one will work. All right. Test. Are we good? Either one? There we go. All right. We're back on. Very good. Okay. Well, I was going to say thank you for humoring me with a song about simplicity of life called Simple Gift. Uh, I could have made another choice. One time I was a guest speaker at a funeral. I did not have any control over any of the music that was chosen at that funeral. Everybody showed up to the funeral in their Alabama jerseys, and they sang Leonard Skinner's Simple Man. So I didn't pick that one. It did happen. It did happen. It was good. It was good. It was different. It, it'll go with my book one day. But today, uh, we'll be learning about simplicity from a passage we've been uh, discussing for the last few weeks. It's from 1 Timothy chapter 6. I invite you to turn to your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 6. We'll start in the second half of the second verse. Listen for God's word. Paul says to Timothy to teach and urge these duties. Whoever teaches otherwise and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that is in accordance with godliness is conceited, understanding nothing, has a morbid craving for controversy and disputes about words. And from these come envy, dissension, slander, base suspicions, wrangling among those who are depraved in mind and bereft of the truth imagining that godliness is a means of gain. Of course, godliness, uh, there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. For we brought nothing into this world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these but those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. But as for you, man of God, shun all of this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of eternal life for which you were called and for which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. And in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Jesus Christ, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blame until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the right time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, it is he alone who has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be glory and honor and eternal dominion. Amen. But as for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty, or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, 
and thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Well, at our house, from time to time, I hate to admit it, but from time to time at our house, we watch reality television. Be honest, how many of y'all watch reality television? Man, Miss Atwood, she loves documentaries. Now, particularly, she likes ones where somebody gets killed. I sometimes say, somebody dies on my television every night. Maggie's laughing because she knows. She's like, ooh, I'm going up to my room. Um, but one of my favorite ones is not one of these uh, true crime ones, but uh, one of my favorite reality shows is Hoarders. How many of you have ever seen the show Hoarders? The show Hoarders, yes. Um, <laughs> on this show, uh, there are people who just collect stuff until it completely takes over their lives. Their homes are packed to the gills, and the backyard is full, and the shed is full, and this, you know, and, and eventually, eventually, their stuff takes over their lives. And many times it gets really gross, you know, it gets overrun with mice and, or cats or bugs or whatever. And, and at some point, uh, at some point when it's completely out of control, there's an intervention. Usually it's the children of the hoarders that come in and say, Mom, Dad, you can't live like this. Sometimes it's the neighbors that come in, you know, and they're like, we can't be neighbors next to you because you're a public health risk. You know, sometimes, sometimes it's the, the code enforcement for the city. And so the intervention happens, and, and many times it's city officials and the children and the grandchildren, and they even bring in a, a psychologist most of the time to talk to the person whose life has completely gone off the rails because of their stuff, their stuff. I saw one where the man had put so much stuff in his house that when they started to clear it out, the house was being held. The weight of the stuff had broken down the structure of the house. When the stuff started to come down, the house collapsed. The house collapsed. Good news is the man had another house behind his house also full of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> he had he had a bus, he had a forklift, he had he had like 30 cars. You know, it was unreal with I was like, how could this man afford all of this stuff? But when they came in to clear out his stuff, man, it was the most painful process. It was the most painful process. He had a big piece of land in Alaska, and every single piece of stuff that they brought before him and said, Dad, do you want to keep this or you want to throw it? Every single thing that he got rid of, every one of those 30, 50, 60 cars, whatever they were, it was like a piece of himself was being removed to get rid of anything. Eventually, they were able to move him into the other little house. And when he saw it cleared of all this stuff and made nice, he was like, Wow, I can live a normal life free from all that had encumbered me. It's painful because in each and every object, there was a question of prioritization, of prioritization. What is essential? What do you really need? And what is unessential? What can you live without? You know, how many old magazines do you need? Are you ever going to read these newspapers from 50 years ago? You know, how many of the styrofoam uh, trays that you bought meat on are you ever going to use again, right? But each and every one of those choices for, though, for that man was an emotional, a psychological, and a spiritual matter. He had accumulated all this stuff because of different traumas that had happened in his life uh, when he went through a painful divorce. And later, his wife that he continued to love had passed away. One of his children had committed suicide. And there was an emotional, psychological, and spiritual reason for how his life 
had come off the rails that way. He used his attachment to things as a tool to manage something that was empty and broken on the inside. And because he only felt uh, a momentary relief in each thing that he acquired, then he could never truly be satisfied. And, and once that was the tool to try to manage life and the pain in his heart, there was no end to the accumulation of objects that instead of bringing healing and setting him free would actually weigh down his life. His life was cluttered because he hadn't found a real way to deal with what was broken in his soul. Hopefully, few of us are hoarders. Now, this guy with his guitars and cables for guitars might be an exception. Where's Mary? <laughs> No, he's not a hoarder. But hopefully, few of us are hoarders. But, but, all of us, all of us are in danger of a spiritual issue, a spiritual issue, an undealt with emotional issue that makes us a hoarder of a certain type. Uh, of having an emotional attachment to the unnecessary, unimportant things of life to the point that we become incapa incapacitated in living the full and abundant life that God intended for us. All of us have the temptation to think that the things that don't matter will satisfy us to the point that we miss out on the things that truly do matter. And so, so Christians have long recognized a, a spiritual value, a Christian practice called simplicity. And simplicity means this. Simplicity means that we measure life not always but by what we add in our lives, but many times we measure the quality of our life by those things that we take away. And that when we take away things from our lives that are unnecessary, that don't have any foundation in ultimate reality, that it makes room in our lives for the things in life that truly do matter for eternity's sake. I don't know that this is true, but I've heard for years and years and years, and it's an old preacher story, so I'm going to tell it anyhow. All right, let's pretend it's true. Fair enough? I've heard that the way you trap a monkey, have you ever heard this? The way that you trap a monkey is that you put some food in, in a thing that is just big enough for the monkey to be able to get his hand in, but when he grabs a hold of it, it's too big for him to get his fist out, right? He reaches in there and he grabs it, and he'll just sit there and will not turn loose. And because he's holding on to something, you know, some nut or berry or something, that he, he's stuck because of his attachment to something where he could find another nut or berry, but he's lost his freedom. And, and that is the trap that the devil puts us in. I've got to hold on to this thing. I won't let it go. And then we're trapped. We're trapped. We've lost our ability to be free for the things that truly matter. We get, we get stuck in the idea that the things of the earth will satisfy us, that, that one more thing is going to fill up that hole. We've got to have it, got to have it, got to have one more purse, got to have one more sh pair of shoes, got to have one more guitar, one more <laughs> uh, gadget, right? Or I need to do one more activity, go on one more vacation. I need a bigger house. I need a newer house. I need to get my, I got to get my,
kitchen redone. I need a newer car, bigger car, fancier car, my friend's car, right? I need a new toy, maybe a bigger truck, or maybe a jet ski, or a boat, or another gun, or more guns, or a golf cart, or more books, uh uh-oh, or bow ties, oh my, right? It goes on and on and on. Maybe the new thing I need is another plaque on the wall that tells me about my accolades and tells me that I really am somebody. Maybe it's a a bigger number in my IRA or who knows what it might be, but we can get trapped in the monkey trap of thinking that things that we did not bring into this life, Paul says, and we cannot take out of this life are the things that make our life, and they are not. Paul says this in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 through 19. As for those who in the present age are rich, and because we live in the richest country in the world, even those who are poorest among us are, are the richest. We are all in this category. We are the people who are rich in this present age. As for those in the present age, are rich, command them not to be haughty, not to be arrogant because of what they have, but to set their hope not on the uncertainty of riches, because if our hope is grounded in riches, those things can go away. That's a terrible foundation to build your hope on, but rather on God. Set your hope on God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They, that's us, we are to do good, to be rich in good works, to measure our riches not by how much we have in the bank, but by how much we offer in the world. Generous, ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. What makes a life that really is life? And the answer is to know where your hope lies, to put your hope in something that is real and cannot fail. The hoarder says, I'm going to take this thing and I'm going to hold on to it because if somebody takes this thing away, then I'm lost. My stepfather's mother, my grandma, Almanyana, uh, she, she, uh, was, uh, she sewed and she went through the depression, which meant that when she bought a piece of fabric, she had it forever forever. I can remember that when she passed away, there was a whole bedroom upstairs that was crammed to the gills with little pieces of fabric. What happened to them? After she died, what happened to them? They went in the dumpster. The dumpster got filled over and over and over again. But if you had said to her, A week before she went to heaven, if you'd said to her, can we take this little piece of fabric? No, I might need it. I'd be lost. Right? That's an extreme example. But look in your own heart and ask yourself, What is it in your life that, if lost, would make you feel as if you were lost? What is it that's in your life that, if lost, would make you feel as if you were lost? Your job? Your savings? Man, my buddy, I've told you all, some of you all, this story many times. My buddy Jeffrey Lentz is a pastor at First Methodist Church in Port St. Joe. And he had a collection of bow ties that put mine to shame. He had hundreds of bow ties 
hundreds of bow ties and as many books as I have. And when Hurricane Michael came, it washed away every book, every bow tie. It washed away his wedding pictures. It washed away his children's toys. It washed away every stick of furniture that he owned. It washed away everything that he had collected for his whole life. And it was hard, right? Because so many of those things were tied to his identity. The things that were a part of himself that had meaning to him and friends, it's real easy living in this life to think that the things that we collect in this life define us. They tell us who we are. They comfort us and they give us security. Riding around a big truck, feel like a big man. Well, I got a real little car. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> You know, but some, I see a lady get a new pair of cute shoes, and she's like, I'm cute, right? I mean, the things that we have that we surround ourselves with give us a sense of who we are. This is the lie that the world tells us because they want to separate us from our money. You are what you buy. That is a lie. You are not defined by anything in this world. The thing that tells you who you are is this cross. This cross tells you who you are. And if you look for anything in this world to tell you what you are, there will be a hole in your soul that you can never fill. And God says that you are the righteousness of Christ. God says in this cross that you are loved from the foundation of the earth. God says that you are precious enough to send his son to die for you. That's God's statement about you. And that's where you place your hope, a hope that can't be shaken. It doesn't mean that things in the earth are bad things. There is a tradition in Christianity to treat them that way. It's called asceticism. Asceticism says that, uh, that, that things in the earth are no good. Spiritual things are the only good things. And you've got monks and people out in the desert, you know, who wear loincloth and eat three pieces of grain a day and all that type of thing. And, and that's not biblical Christianity. It says here that God richly supplies everything, everything that we have, for our enjoyment. The things that we have in this world are from God. He wants us to have them. And if we understand that, we can enjoy them with gratitude and free from arrogance. You know, if God gave them to me, then I can't be all proud of what I have. I didn't get it for myself. It came from God. But much more importantly, Paul calls us to an honest reckoning, a searching of our souls to question where we place our hope. Now, many of us will say, oh, hope, that means that I believe that uh, when I die, I get to go to heaven. That's hope. And it is, but I don't think that's what he means at all. I think he's talking about where our hope is found in this life. Where do we look to have life in this life? Because he says, very next thing he says after hope is that they may take hold to a life that really is life. And a life that is grounded in things that will not remain and are not real is no life at all. This is why the spiritual uh, practice of simplicity is, a, is, is really important. It's so important from time to time to take a life audit, to say, what are those things in my life that are essential? Am I putting my energy and my, my, uh, my hope and my love, my time in those things or I've allowed all these other things to accrue in such a way that I am way down from being set free for a life that will matter for eternity. 
One way I'm forced to audit myself from time to time is being a Methodist preacher. I move. I've moved 18 times in my life. 18 times. You, you know what you do when you move? You, you pack the stuff up, and you've got to decide, is it really worth moving this to another place, right? <laughs> so, so there's a constant auditing. You know, when we moved, when we moved uh, this summer, there, there were dozens of garbage bags full of stuff that didn't make it from one house to the other across Mariana. That, that was a good, good thing to say, do I need this or do I not? Does this thing matter or does it not? And how freeing it is to let go, to let go. For me, many times the things that weigh my life down aren't necessarily objects, but they're activities that accrue in my life that just like load me up with busyness. And every now and then I have to say, of all these things that I'm doing, what has God called me to do? And what are the things that I'm doing just because they're good things? But I'm not supposed to be the person doing this anymore. I've done that many times. And at the end of that process, today I'm on the clergy advisory board for the Northwest Florida United Methodist Children's Home. I'm on the clergy advisory board for the Candler School of Theology at Emory University. I don't know why these people want my opinion. I'm on the district committee, uh, uh, ordained ministry for the Mariana Panama City District Board of Ordained Ministry. I, I'm a second reader for a doctor of ministry uh, uh, a candidate at Southeastern University in Lakeland, Florida. I'm proofreading a book right now. I could go on and on and on and on and on, and this is after my audit, right? Can anybody relate? Yeah. And when we were stuck, not able to do much, in the first weeks after COVID happened, and we had Maggie at the house all the time because there was no school, right? About two weeks after COVID hit, Maggie and I went out in the front yard, and what happened? I taught her how to ride a bike. That was something that being forced to simplify made me attend to something I really should have attended to much earlier. Simplicity is about doing a life audit and prioritizing and sitting down and saying, does this thing need to stay or does this thing need to go? It's not, it's not about being poor or living poor. I've told you all about my friend Paul Lynch. Paul Lynch is a, is a, uh, was my college roommate, and he became a doctor. He became an anesthesiologist. He became a pain management doctor, and he eventually opened eight pain management clinics in Arizona. And so uh, I don't talk to Dr. Lynch very often, but from time to time I would see him on Facebook, you know, and he would be with his son playing golf in Hawaii, or here's his car where the doors go up this way instead of like that, you know? It's like, <laughs> it's like we are two different kind of doctors that came out of that dorm room, let me tell you. But when, when COVID hit, he had done his residency at... A hospital in Manhattan, New York City, and he loaded up on an airplane and flew to that hospital to help COVID uh, patients in the height of the worst time in New York City, when it was most dangerous, with people dying uh, by the dozens every day. And somebody said, well, you know, you've got a wife and you've got children and, uh, and you've, got, uh, you've got a practice. Uh, do you think it's wise to put all that at risk? And sure enough, he caught COVID and was very, very sick. He did survive. One of his kids has got a disability. They need him. Do you think that this is wise for you to put yourself at risk like this? And he said, yes, and I'll tell you why. Because what I want for my children most is that they will grow up to be the kind of 
people that if the building is on fire and somebody's in there, that they will run into that building to save them instead of taking care of themselves. I am more concerned of the values I put in my children than whether I live or die. Now that's a man who has learned the power of simplicity to know what matters and what doesn't. One of my great heroes is a singer named Rich Mullins. He wrote the song, uh, Our God is an Awesome God. Our God is an Awesome God. Y'all know the song? Yeah. Um, he's, he wrote Amy Grant's song, Sing your praise to the Lord. Come on up. Y'all know that one? Yeah. So Rich Mullins was one of the first Christian music celebrities. He's one of the first Christian pop stars. But he was a real Christian a real Christian, and he was worried that becoming a Christian celebrity would destroy his soul. And so right at the beginning of his fame, when he had his first big hit, he went to the elders of his church, a little church in Kansas, right outside of Wichita, Kansas. And he said, listen, I don't want to know how much money I make. And he instructed that all of his royalty checks be sent to his church and that there be an independent board that would pay him a salary that was based on the average pay of a public school teacher. And that everything else would be given to the poor. That freed him in all kinds of ways um, from being <laughs> the rat race of Christian celebrity. And when he died in a terrible accident, Rich Mullins was working on a Native American reservation as a music teacher at no cost. It was the discipline of simplicity that both preserved his heart and set him free for eternal life. So today, I'm calling all of us, myself included, to do a life audit that would be as painful as when the children of the hoarder bring the objects before the hoarder parent and said, which one are you going to keep and which one are you going to lose? To strip ourselves of those things that are weighing us down, to free ourselves, to hold on to a life that is life. There's a great apocryphal story about a man who visited an eminent rabbi seeking wisdom. And he walked into the rabbi's home and was amazed at how spare the house was. There was almost no furniture in the house. And instead of asking a spiritual question, the first thing he asked is he said, why do you have no furniture in this house? And the rabbi responded to the man. He said, why do you have no furniture in this house? And the rabbi and the man said, well, because this isn't my home. I'm just visiting. I'm just passing through. And the rabbi said, so am I. So am I. We're just passing through, friends. There's some things we're going to need along the way, like when Frank climbs a high mountain, he just takes exactly what he needs and no more because anything extra would weigh him down. And that's you and that's me. May we hold on to a life that is life and let go of everything else that we may have every good and perfect gift that God has in his hand for us to receive in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's sing together, stand and sing together. I'd rather have Jesus.
Almighty God, cause your good gifts to flow in and through our lives and ministry this day and always. Amen.